Thanks very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many people here. And thank you to Grammarly for inviting me. Uh, it's my first time in Ukraine, so, and so far it's been great. Um, my name is Marek. I am a senior research associate in Cambridge, and I work on various topics related to uh, machine learning and language processing. And today I'll talk uh, to you a bit about uh, our work on understanding and assessing language and specifically uh, using neural network uh, models. The world is becoming more and more globalized. And that means that more and more people are learning uh, different languages. Uh, there's currently an estimated uh, 1.5 billion people learning English. And this number is expected to grow up to uh, 1.9 billion within a couple of years. So that has created a situation where um, there's simply a shortage of language teachers. And um, one possible option for this problem uh, would be to create automated solutions for language teaching and assessment. So imagine an automated system that can uh, analyze your writing give you feedback, give you a language proficiency score, and guide you in your studies. Uh, that kind of system would have uh, uh, beneficial uh, applications for both the students and the teachers. Uh, so for students, uh, they would be able to get immediate feedback. So imagine uh, writing an essay, pressing a button, and uh, ge getting the results right away. Um, they can uh, learn in a self-assessment or self-tutoring framework, uh, and the tool would be uh, online or available all the time so that they can learn at their own pace and exactly when uh, they have time and feel comfortable. Uh, for teachers, that would mean a reduced workload, um, so they can use this time to either uh, deal with more students or focus on more interesting topics and more challenging areas as opposed to uh, spending time uh, correcting uh, hundreds of homework exercises. And uh, such a tool would also be cost effective. So an automated system needs to be de developed once and then it's uh, ready and can be easily deployed to uh, schools or areas or countries where um, uh, hiring additional language teachers would be too expensive. So what do I mean by language assessment? Um, first of all, I don't mean things like uh, fill in the blanks or uh, multiple choice questions because these can be easily uh, um, automated already. Uh, what I do mean is uh, dealing with uh, free text answers, so something like a student writing an essay and then the system giving feedback on it. And uh, that's a much more challenging task and at the same time it, it also uh, allows the student to show their skills much more than something like a multiple choice question. Um, so given a text we would want to be able to uh, first perform an evaluation, so things like detecting uh, any errors in the writing, uh, calculating uh, an overall score for the writing quality, uh, predict, uh, predicting a language proficiency score. So this is something that could correspond to uh, levels in official language tests. Um, and then also giving uh, detailed analytic scores about uh, different aspects of the writing. So is this on topic, uh, is, the, uh, is this uh, uh, text coherent and uh, cohesive and things like that. Uh, and once we've done the evaluation part, we would also like to provide guidance to the students. So uh, we would want to show them detailed uh, progress reports of how they're performing and whether they are improving their uh, language skills. Um, we would like to provide corrections for the errors so that they can actually learn um, what they have done wrong and how to uh, do it correctly. Um, also suggest uh, specific areas that they should be focusing on in order to progress in their language skills. And then ideally also to generate exercises that are tailored for each specific student and their particular skill set. 
So in this talk, um, I will be giving an overview of three different parts of automated assessment that are fairly central to the overall goal. Uh, first about the error detection, then error correction, and then essay scoring. And for each of these, I'll, I'll uh, introduce the main task. I'll give a bit of a uh, background and motivation, and then I'll try to give some taste about the most recent uh, uh, work uh, that we've been looking into as well. And finally, we'll look at some interesting uh, future directions of uh, where this line of work could go. Um, the work that I'm going to be talking about today comes mostly from the Cambridge Alta group that uh, Joel already mentioned. Uh, I am a part of this group as well, and it is a large project in Cambridge working on automated language assessment. Um, the people you see pictured here are the people in uh, the uh, computer laboratory group. Um, and in addition to this group, there's also additional groups in uh, the linguistics department, the engineering department, and then in Cambridge English, which actually uh, performs uh, language tests across the world. Uh, so let's start with error detection. Um, in the task of error detection, we are given a text such as a sentence and we want to be able to automatically detect uh, errors in that text. Um, so in, in this sentence, we would like to automatically figure out that this word is incorrect. And um, this particular case is quite easy because we're dealing with a spelling mistake and we can just look up that this word doesn't uh, appear in any English, uh, English dictionary. Um, so it's likely to be uh, an error. Um, but there are actually uh, quite a few different types of errors that we can make. So here you can see a distribution of the different errors annotated in uh, the data of language learners. Um, each color represents a different error, uh, error type, and the blue triangle over here is uh, the spelling errors. So spelling errors are indeed uh, the most frequent error type in uh, learner data. Uh, but if we chose to only focus on spelling errors, then we would cover only a very small portion of the overall uh, error space. And even if we chose, uh, let's say, five or six uh, most frequent error types, then still we, ha we have this really long tail of uh, different errors that would basically be left unhandled. So ideally, we would want systems that are able to handle all different types of errors at the same time. Here you can see uh, some examples of specific error types. Um, so these are the five most frequent errors. Uh, and uh, along with the percentage of errors that they uh, make up. Uh, so we have spelling errors, missing punctuation, incorrect punctuation, incorrect preposition, and verb tense errors. Um, and together they might make up about 35% of the overall error space. Um, now here's some examples from the longer tail. So these are more complicated and uh, slightly less intuitive errors. So things like word order errors where uh, the, all the words are correct, but uh, are, are actually written in a slightly unusual order. Uh, verb agreement errors, uh, spelling errors that actually produce a valid word, so these can be really difficult to detect. Um, things like uh, incorrect idioms, and then we also have a special class for complex errors. So these are errors where there's many different errors interacting, and it's uh, difficult for the annotators to figure out what the actual error type was. So they mark the whole sentence as an error. Mm, so we want to approach this project, uh, this problem from a machine learning perspective. Uh, and this is the general um, algorithm basically. So uh, a high level look at it, uh, what we do is we collect data uh, that's written by real language learners and has been marked and annotated by language experts. We then create uh, machine learning algorithms 
that look at this data, uh, discover regularities, uh, and uh, learn different patterns in the data. And once we have uh, this machine learning model, we can then apply to new data in order to predict uh, specific uh, errors uh, um, and error locations in the data. Um, the way that we approach this mach machine learning model uh, is using neural networks and deep learning. Um, so I won't be going into uh, full details about the background of neural networks, but just like a quick uh, introduction, uh, just in case. Uh, when dealing with neural networks, uh, we these are models of highly connected uh, networks. So um, the, each uh, circle in this graph represents a neuron. Each row represents a neural network layer. Um, these networks contain hundreds or maybe thousands of uh, different parameters. These parameters are initialized randomly, and then during uh, model chaining, they are optimized so that they learn to automatically discover uh, useful features in the data uh, that are help in solving a particular task. And you can see that each neuron is connected to all the layer, all the neurons in the previous layer, um, and that allows the model to learn features of features. Uh, so increasingly complicated feature combinations, uh, which make uh, neural networks very powerful. Uh, and neural network and deep learning models have achieved uh, state-of-the-art results on pretty much all natural language processing tasks uh, in the couple of years, in the past couple of years. Um, so here you can see uh, the basic neural network model uh, that we're going to be using for error detection. Um, the way this works is individual words go into the network. Uh, they get mapped to uh, word embeddings. Uh, then these go into a bidirectional recurrent neural network that builds uh, context-specific representations uh, moving through the sentence left to right and right to left. Um, we then take the hidden representations from each direction, combine these together to get this uh, new hidden representation over here, and that is now a vector that represents uh, one specific word in one specific position, but it's conditioned on the whole sentence on both sides of that word. Uh, so the model has uh, the capability of looking at the context on, left, uh, on, on the left and on the right side of the word. And then based on that, we predict a label distribution. So we predict the probability uh, of uh, this specific word being correct or incorrect given the context. Uh, we optimize the model by minimizing the negative log likelihood, uh, which uh, basically means that we optimize the model to predict a high probability uh, for the correct label for each word. Uh, here you can see an evaluation of this. Um, so we uh, use the first certificate in English data set. This is a, a data set released in 2011. It contains uh, 1,141 manually annotated essays that are written by uh, language learners uh, learning English. Um, and they have been annotated by uh, language experts. Um, and uh, they contain free text essays, uh, so things like writing a letter to your friend or writing about your summer vacation or something like that. Uh, and the data set is publicly available. Um, the evaluation metrics that we use is F05. Um, so that, for those of you not familiar with it, uh, F measure is, uh, is a measure that combines uh, the precision, so how accurate we are in making uh, predictions and then also recall, uh, which measures how many of the errors we actually find. So it combines both these properties together and F05 specifically uh, puts more focus on precision, so making uh, precise predictions. So if we make a precision about the error, we uh, want it to actually be an error. Um, 
And here you can see some results. So these are the baseline results uh, we'll be talking about. Um, on the FCE, it gets about 41% FO5. Uh, Connell 14 is a different uh, error, um, uh, error detection and correction data set. Uh, now, uh, it's well known that more data leads to better performance. Uh, so you can see that here. If we train using the publicly available FC data set, we get about 41% on FC. And however, if we use a private uh, corpus called Cambridge Learner Corpus, uh, then we get considerably better performance at 64%. Um, the problem is that that corpus is not available for general use. Um, it's restricted uh, by Cambridge English. So ideally, we would like to have methods uh, that allow us to improve performance uh, without relying on uh, this privately available corpus. So one uh, option that we can take is to generate artificial data. Uh, in order to train our models. And with error detection, this is actually a feasible idea because uh, generating errors uh, is a somewhat uh, more plausible task than generating some other types of data. So what we need is systems that can take grammatically correct text and create errors into it uh, that look like human errors. Now, uh, the first idea that we can do uh, is to just randomly generate these errors. So let's say uh, we take a grammatically correct sentence, we delete some words, we insert some words, we swap some words around, and then uh, use this data for training. And we can basically generate unlimited amounts of data. Uh, the problem is that this doesn't actually uh, lead to an improvement uh, because the errors that it generates uh, are not the same kinds of errors that a human makes. So the model actually uh, can end up getting a lower performance because it starts assigning um, model capabilities to learning patterns that are not really useful for uh, error detection in a real world. Another idea that we did uh, last year, uh, we tried using a pattern-based approach. So what, we, what this is, is we use um, data of existing errors in order to extract patterns and then insert these patterns into new text containing some similar cues. For example, here, if we have the sentence, we went shop on Saturday, so that's an original incorrect sentence. It comes with a correction, uh, we went shopping on Saturday. Uh, then we can extract this kind of pattern. Um, so shop goes to shopping, and the other uh, cues are part of speech tags. So these are uh, general word uh, classes. Uh, we, if we then see in new text a sentence, I was shopping on Monday, uh, then we can match this pattern and use it in the opposite direction in order to generate a sentence, I was shopping, uh, sorry, I was shop on Monday. So now we have uh, successfully generated uh, a sentence with an error in it that looks kind of like the type of error that a human would actually make. Um, and the third idea is to use machine translation. Um, here, um, you're no, uh, probably familiar with uh, regular machine translation. Uh, these are models that are trained to translate from uh, one language to the other. So, uh, for example, English to French. Um, but now what we do instead, we train a model to translate from regular English into faulty English. Um, and the good uh, side of this approach is that we can actually use regular off-the-shelf machine translation tools for this. And you can see some examples here of uh, what the output looks like. Um, the first line is just a regular uh, correct sentence. The second line is using the pattern-based approach. Uh, it replaces and with an, years with year. 
Uh, and then w the machine translation based approach uh, replaces equal with equals. And th these are um, examples of errors that we can then use for uh, training error detection systems. And you can see some example uh, results here. Um, the baseline system uses 450,000 words of annotated data, um, on top of which we will add 40, uh, 4.5 million examples of uh, uh, 4.5 million words of uh, automatically generated data. And these are the results. So uh, the baseline gets 41% on FC. Uh, using the pattern-based approach, we improve this to 47%. Um, if instead we use the machine translation approach, we get 48%. And if we combine both of these together, we get an absolute 8% improvement uh, over the baseline. So we can get quite a lot better uh, by uh, automatically generating error examples. Um, next, uh, let's look at error correction. Uh, this is a re very related task. Um, so when uh, we were talking about error detection, we just wanted to identify uh, the location of each individual error. Uh, in the error correction task, we also want to provide corrections uh, for each of the detected errors. Um, and the common way to approach a machine uh, uh, error correction is to use machine translation. So before, uh, for generating artificial data, we went from English to faulty English, but with uh, error correction, we now go from faulty English to correct English. Um, so the example would look like this. If uh, we give us input, we can invite also people who are not members. Uh, the model would give us output we can also invite people who are not members. Uh, in, the input is a sentence, the output is also a full sentence, but hopefully with all the errors corrected. Um, a classical approach to um, error correction is to use a statistical machine translation model. Uh, what this does is it first separates the word into smaller units, so uh, phrases or multi-word units. Uh, it then learns an alignment between uh, the phrases in each language. Uh, so, na, Canada uh, gets translated to in Canada, it, and it learns these kinds of uh, uh, translation tables for all the phrases in the training data. Um, and then these are used uh, to generate new translations uh, and a language model can be used in order to make sure that um, the output that comes out of the model after stitching together the different phrases actually is still fluent and makes sense. Uh, the modern approach uh, to machine translation is to use neural machine translation. Um, and there are currently many different models out there uh, with very uh, various architectures, uh, but the basic approach uh, is a sequence to sequence model. Um, and what this does is um, it takes as input a sentence, um, it uh, processes it and creates a single vector S um, using an encoder architecture. So this part of the architecture is the encoder. Uh, we create the S and then uh, we have a separate part that, uh, that's called a decoder that generates a sentence in the uh, target language using this vector. Um, and the model is uh, trained end-to-end -end so that uh, it learns uh, to generate an informative vector using the encoder. And, it, and then it learns to generate a good output sentence uh, using this vector. Uh, one problem with uh, using neural models for error correction is how they handle uh, out of vocabulary words. Uh, so neural models usually have a, a rather fixed and limited vocabulary. Uh, and all the other words are represented with out of vocabulary tokens. Um, and 
this causes problems in the translation. So you can see here, uh, if we give us input, I aren't seen Albert since last summer, uh, then maybe the machine translation model can manage to fix the error. So it produces, I haven't seen, uh, but because it hasn't observed the word Albert in the training data, uh, it uh, doesn't exist in its vocabulary. Uh, so it can't actually produce this in the output sentence. Uh, and all it can do is produce an OOV or out of vocabulary token in that position. Uh, and that's a problem because now we've fixed one error, but we've actually introduced another. Um, and the way to approach this, uh, uh, one possible solution is to uh, align these uh, tokens from the input uh, to the proposed translation. Uh, and once we manage to align each word, then it becomes uh, easier to actually have a separate model component uh, that translates uh, directly this word, sorry, uh, the OOV tag into the original word that occurred in the, in the input sentence. So basically it's a, uh, an extra processing step uh, that goes and looks at what the OOV word um, must have been like in the original input sentence. Um, and here you can see some results. Um, so the first line is the statistical machine translation uh, optimized for uh, performing on performing well on the FC dataset. Um, then the second one is the neural machine translation uh, using the alignment method. So it gets a little bit better uh, over the statistical machine translation. Now, how can we do even better? Um, one problem with machine translation is that um, even though it might generate the correct sentence as one of the candidates, it doesn't always rank it at the top. Um, so yeah, you can see an example here. Uh, given the source sentence, the system uh, has ranked the correct translation or the correct version of that sentence as the second one. So ideally, we would want to uh, have a method that goes through the proposed translations uh, and uh, boosts the score of the correct uh, translation. Um, so how can we do this? Um, one option is to take advantage of the error detection system that I described before, uh, because it's a different model and it learns to learns uh, different properties compared to the error correction system, um, where error, the error correction system um, might uh, might be able to detect the presence of an error, but if it doesn't exactly know how to correct a specific error then it might leave it uncorrected or it might just provide like a random useless correction instead. Uh, so it's useful to know uh, what the error detection model thinks. Um, what we can do is we can get uh, confidence probabilities from the error detection model. Uh, here you can see that for each word it predicts a score that says how good uh, how confident the model is that uh, this specific word is correct given the context. So it gets a high score for these words, uh, but a low score for here because uh, the user has uh, made an error there. Um, so uh, how can we combine this into uh, a score that helps us re-rank correction candidates? Um, we use three different scoring methods. So one is to uh, simply uh, combine all the word level scores uh, to get a sentence level correctness score. Um, then we can measure uh, how well uh, the error uh, correction system um, uh, has corrected uh, exactly the words that the error detection system thinks are errors. Uh, so we can, um, count the words that the error detection system thinks are errors, in this case two, and see if these two are also uh, corrected by the correction system. And then uh, finally, we can measure the agreement between the uh, error detection and the error correction system. Um, so in addition to seeing 
whether uh, the model has um, uh, fixed all the words that the de detection system thinks are incorrect, uh, we can also see um, whether uh, the words that it has fixed uh, are the ones that the error detection system thinks are incorrect. And you can see some results here. Um, so if we do uh, the detection and the correction process, then we manage to improve uh, about 2% on the SC dataset and 3% on the Connell 14 dataset. So we are uh, constantly improving the performance of the correction system. Uh, you can see some output examples here. Um, so let's say the sentence is, I work with children and the computer helped my job that affected too. Um, then if we pass this through a um, machine translation system that's designed to uh, correct the sentence, uh, then it will correct this, mo uh, this word, and to and, uh, but it leaves this part uncorrected because it doesn't really know what to do with it. Uh, however, if we combine the detection model into uh, there as well, then the detection model detects this part as incorrect, and then it influences the correction model to actually provide a correction here, and it manages to correct more of the sentence. Uh, similarly here, uh, the original model leaves uh, this word uncorrected, but if we combine it with the detection model, uh, then we get uh, a correction for both of the errors. Uh, but this doesn't, of course, uh, always work. So in this case, uh, the machine translation model didn't provide any corrections, uh, but uh, if we combine it with the corrections, uh, sorry, the detection system, uh, then we managed to influence the model to provide a, a correction there, but this correction was still incorrect in that case. Okay, finally, uh, let's talk about the third big task uh, that we're dealing with, and that's essay scoring. Uh, in essay scoring, we would like to uh, be able to take a free text, uh, like an essay written by a language learner, and uh, assign it uh, uh, a class that represents the proficiency uh, of that learner. Uh, for example, here you can see one uh, language proficiency system uh, with six classes, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, and each one of these uh, represents a uh, an incrementally higher level of language proficiency. Um, the classical way of uh, approaching uh, essay scoring is to use a feature-based system. Uh, so we take the essay, we break it down uh, into individual smaller features, and then we optimize a machine learning model that uh, assigns weights to each of these features. Uh, the kinds of features that we might uh, extract from an essay are uh, word sequences of different lengths. Uh, so single words, uh, word pairs, word triples. Uh, also part of speech tags, so these are uh, word types. Uh, grammatical constructions, uh, we can use parsers to parse the text. And, and uh, we can extract the types of uh, operations that the parser needs to do in order to combine the text together. Um, so this gives us information about the grammatical constructions. Uh, also complexity measures. Um, these, are, uh, these can be extracted from the parsers. So for example, uh, the length of the sentence and the longest path in the dependency graph of the sentence and measures like this. Um, also semantic similarity between sentences. Um, it's uh, useful to encode as a feature that, uh, that the student actually uh, um, talks about the same topic as it's going through the essay uh, and doesn't jump between the different topics. So we can encode how similar uh, two consecutive sentences are on average. And finally, uh, an estimated error count. Uh, we could get that either using the error detection uh, described before 
or we can um, get a score for it uh, using something like a lookup from a larger corpus. Uh, if, if a specific word sequence doesn't appear in, in a, a large data set, then it's likely to be an error. Um, and here you can see some results for the essay scoring. Uh, we measure uh, performance using Spearman's correlation. Uh, and this basically uh, measures how well the scores that we predict are correlated with the scores uh, that humans have assigned to these essays. Uh, using only word sequences, we get about 60% correlation. Uh, using part of speech tags, we, this goes up to 68. Um, yeah, including syntax structure, we get 72. Uh, and error rate, uh, estimated error rate, gets us up to 78%. And you can see that the human, uh, the correlation between two human annotators is uh, around 79%. So uh, the automated system is actually getting really, really close already uh, to the uh, human qu uh, quality of assessing uh, essays. Um, recent work has also looked at uh, neural models for essay scoring and uh, there are two types of architectures that we would normally consider for uh, such a task. Uh, one is a bi-directional LSTM. Um, so this is similar to the model that we looked at before. Uh, we have two recurrent neural networks operating over the sentence. Uh, they combine together uh, the hidden representations from both directions and then use this to predict the score. Uh, the other is a convolutional neural network, um, and what these do is they um, basically have a sliding window over the text, and they extract, they learn to extract features within that window, and then these win uh, features are combined together into a document level representation, and then we can predict the score from that. And each of these approaches has their um, uh, positive and negative sides. So. Um, the bidirectional LSTM uh, can model very long-term contexts, uh, but also if the essay is very long, then uh, it might lose some information that's uh, important in the middle. Uh, at the same time, uh, the convolutional neural networks are great at looking at local uh, features uh, in a small window, but uh, they can't really model uh, features that span uh, long distances or even between sentences. Um, the recent work uh, that we've been looking at uh, in terms of uh, neural essay scoring has been focused on uh, improving word representations uh, for these models. Uh, so the underlying idea is to uh, get more useful information into the word representations uh, so that they can help with the end task of uh, uh, essay scoring. Um, this is work that was done by Dimitris, uh, who is now actually working in uh, Grammarly in New York. Uh, so uh, when he was in Cambridge, we did this in collaboration. Um, and what this model does is, um, it uh, pre-trains neur uh, neural embeddings to predict the score of an essay, uh, as well as predicting uh, whether a specific sequence is correct or incorrect. Uh, so the way the model is trained is we give uh, it uh, a small window of uh, word sequences as input. Um, and then we have two outputs in the model that uh, the model learns to predict. One is whether this um, sequence is correct or not. And the second is whether, uh, the, uh, the second output is the score of the essay from which this word sequence came from. Um, and during training, in order to get, get the uh, examples of incorrect sequences, we simply, um, uh, replace some words in the middle with random words, so we create random errors, basically. Um, here you can see uh, some examples of this uh, uh, on the results. Um, so 
So we're evaluating the method, which is called score-specific word embeddings on the ASAP dataset. Uh, and in this case, we're using a two-layer bidirectional LSTM model. Um, if we don't use any uh, pre-training, we don't uh, get any of these benefits. So we get a Spearman score of 68%. Uh, if we instead use um, word to vec which is a well-known method for pre-training word embeddings, uh, then we get 79% Spearman's correlation. And now if we use the uh, score-specific word embeddings, we get up to 91% uh, correlation. Uh, this work was recently uh, extended by uh, one of the PhD students in our group. Um, and what she did was, uh, instead of using randomly generated errors, uh, she basically constructed a system that uh, learns to detect real errors in uh, real learner text. Um, and the idea is similar that um, we pre-train the word embeddings uh, in order to differentiate between uh, correct word sequences and incorrect word sequences. Um, and here we are using a different data set and a different uh, um, a network architecture for essay scoring, but we still ran the comparative experiments. So what we see is um, using word to vec uh, we get 56% um, Spearman's correlation. Using GLOV51, uh, so that's another uh, well-known uh, method for pre-training word embeddings. Uh, with the score-specific word embeddings, we get 58%. And uh, if we use the error-specific word embeddings, uh, we get up to 63%. So uh, quite a big improvement uh, in terms of correlation. Uh, the other column is a root mean squared error. Uh, and uh, this measure is better if it's smaller. Um, and finally, I'd like to discuss a bit about uh, the future directions of automated language assessment as well. Uh, so where can we see this uh, field going uh, in the next couple of years? Uh, first of all, I uh, think that we're going to be seeing more and more personalized approaches. So. Uh, models that are able to uh, generate exercises for individual students uh, based on their individual needs and their uh, progress through the learning progress uh, process. Um, also, uh, we're going to be seeing more automated tutoring. So uh, systems uh, that are able to actually interact with you instead of only passively uh, uh, correcting your errors um, but also to um, uh, get you to speak and get you to practice your language. So imagine having something like uh, Google Home or Alexa and uh, having a conversation with you and at the same time uh, correcting your English as well. Um, speech is another uh, important area. So. Um, so far, we've mostly been looking at text and uh, correcting and evaluating text, uh, but uh, spoken language assessment is equally important and a big uh, part of language tests as well. Um, the problem with speech is that um, in order to do spoken language assessment, we need to do uh, speech recognition. And speech recognition is uh, quite challenging even by itself but in uh, uh, language learners, this becomes uh, even more difficult because we're dealing with very different accents, very strong accents, uh, mispronunciations, uh, grammatical errors, hesitations, all these kinds of things that a speech recognition system would need to handle in order to correctly um, deal with uh, spoken language. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the technology will develop and will get uh, better and better and we will we'll move towards uh, uh, speech-based systems more and more. Um, also, I think we'll see more multimodal topics. Um, for example, uh, currently the common standard is to give a textual prompt, uh, such as uh, write a letter to a friend. 
but I think we'll be seeing more examples of images or video or audio being shown to the student and then the student having to write about this. Um, and from a technical standpoint, this creates new challenges because the um, uh, model now needs to actually understand what the image or the video was about. Um, we'll probably also see more uh, specialized systems. Uh, so as I mentioned initially, ideally we would have systems that can handle all types of errors, uh, but uh, this uh, at some point we are going to hit a, a barrier where one single system just can't get better on all the error types. Uh, so we will be looking at uh, systems that are focusing on specific errors and then trying to combine this together with a more general system for other types of errors. And uh, finally, uh, I think multitask learning is going to be quite important because the data sets that we're dealing with at the moment are, are very uh, specific. They need to be annotated uh, for errors by language experts and they originally need to come from uh, real language learners. So th these data sets are quite uh, difficult and uh, expensive to obtain. Um, whereas uh, there are plenty of other data sets available uh, using language in various ways. So ideally we would want to develop methods that can uh, take advantage of these other data sets and other tasks, learn about how language works in general, and then transfer this information back into uh, the error detection and uh, automated assessment tasks that we are actually interested in. Um, and that's about it for me. Um, so we talked about three big parts of uh, automated language assessment. Uh, we talked about error detection um, and um, uh, neural sequence labeling architecture that can perform error detection quite well. Uh, and then we also saw how we can artificially generate data uh, in order to make this uh, learning process even better. Uh, we looked at different ways of performing error correction uh, using statistical machine translation, using neural, trans uh, neural machine translation, and also re-ranking uh, by taking advantage of the previous error detection output. And uh, finally, we discussed uh, essay scoring, um, and we saw how we can perform it using a traditional um, feature-based method, uh, but also um, looking at uh, novel ways of doing this with neural models. Uh, so. Uh, bidirectional LSTMs and convolutional neural networks. Uh, and finally, we discussed how uh, we can specialize word representations so that they would actually perform better uh, on uh, the task of essay scoring. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much.